Um, I know from a birdie that Dan's parents are watching this, so <laughs> I, I want to make sure that we uh, them send them a welcome from <laughs> the U.S. <laughs> uh, I'm going to wait 18 seconds more. I hear a, a gaggle of people coming. Gaggling, actually, by the way. So this is pretty good, guys. This is quite the turnout for an informal seminar. It's, it's, it's owing to the speaker. So, all right. So uh, uh, this is Dan Bang. Uh, he's, he has recently changed his last name from an exclamation mark to the word B-A-N-G. Um, I've known Dan, how long have I known you? For five years? Uh, a bit shorter. Two years. Feels, Two years? Feels like longer. Oh, OK. Well, I'm. I'm like a dog, uh, you know, one year is two and a half for me. So um, uh, uh, Dan did his undergraduate degree at Aarhus um, in like linguistics or cognitive science or something like that. Dan is really, I, I'm uh, loath to categorize him. He has broad interests both in cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, and, and now with neuroscience with us. One of the ways that we have connected is that he and um, his collaborator, Steve Fleming, have come up with a design for a, a classic experiment that's been done in monkeys. This has nothing to do with this talk today. I'm just giving you what his claim to fame is, some of his claims to fame, um, where people accumulate information about dots moving on a screen. There's a delay, and you're later asked to make a judgment over those dots, OK? Uh, there are detailed neural recordings in various areas of the cortex and subcortical regions while these tasks go on in monkeys. Nobody's ever been able to record this thing in a human being. But Dan is now part of a project in collaboration with Ken Kushida, now at Wake Forest, where um, we're recording directly in the striatum of human beings, measuring dopamine and serotonin at sub-second time scales while this task goes on. And we've been spending um, many, many hours together, um, for which I think he's going to pay a price later. Yesterday, when he left my office, he said, that's the first nine and a half hour meeting I've ever had. <laughs> anyway. I'm not sure. I mean, the, I've read the abstract today. He's going to talk to us today about public-private mappings and brain and behavior. Uh, he's here under the what he's listed here, the Sir Henry Welcome um, Postdoctoral Fellowship, which is quite prestigious fellowship that allows him to sort of go around the world and get whatever training and experience he wants. And one part of it's here. I think he's headed to Boston after this to work with uh, Sam Gershman. Um, and then, of course, his work with Steve Fleming. So we, we look forward to hearing the rest of the talk. And I hope your parents enjoy it. <laughs> well, so too. thanks. So let's thank the speaker for coming. Thanks. Yeah, so, so thanks, Reed, for the kind introduction and for the great hospitality, which I've experienced three times now. And I can assure you I'll keep coming back for it. <laughs> so that's good. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is Private Public Mappings in Behavior and Brain. Some parts of the talk, I'll say about 25% are a repetition of, of what I presented last year, which might be good for consolidating those memories. And then there's some new stuff, which I've added quite recently. So, so bear with me as I go through it, as I'm still getting to grips with it myself. OK, so something we often forget as researchers is that in the real world, actions are embedded within contexts, and they should be chosen accordingly. So for instance, in this cartoon scenario, you would say that it's better to eat a burger from a shop than from a bin, or to take a selfie at a party than a funeral, right? And the importance of this kind of context sensitivity is perhaps most apparent when it comes to social interaction, which is the, top, the topic for most of my talk today. So social situations often require dissociation between what we think privately and the expected or required behavior, what we're meant to say publicly. And I just think, uh, invite you to think about how often you've said something you didn't really mean or done something you didn't really want to simply because it seemed like the appropriate thing to do. And critically, there are no universal rules for how to navigate social situations. Social success requires you to, to set this private public mapping in a manner that is most appropriate for the context you find yourself in right now. So this can be challenging, and, in, and indeed, inappropriate social behavior is a common clinical symptom, such as in borderline personality disorder or various dementia syndromes. So the goal of my research is, on, is to understand the cognitive and neural mechanisms that support these private public mappings. So first, how are private states formed? How do we learn which public actions are appropriate in a given context? 
How do we learn which contexts are relevant for behavior? How are these processes implemented in the brain? And how are they altered in clinical conditions characterized by social dysfunction? And in the work I'm going to present today, we have used confidence as a framework for studying or probing these questions. So, so confidence is an interesting psychological variable because there's often a dissociation between the confidence that we feel privately and the confidence that we communicate publicly. And importantly for us, we can dissociate the mapping between these two dimensions. So for example, just to give you some examples, sometimes it pays off to be bimodal, being either completely sure or unsure, as listeners tend to, to be averse to ambiguity. Sometimes it pays off to be submissive when, when hierarchies are in place. Sometimes it pays off to be dominant, as high confidence can translate into social influence. It might make competitors change their mind. And sometimes, perhaps only rarely, and, and hopefully it's going to be the case for the, the talk today, is that it can pay off to reveal your true beliefs. But that's sort of a, an ideal rare scenario. And what we have now is that we have the experimental tools to independently manipulate these two dimensions, private and public confidence. And by doing so, we can probe the mechanisms that support the mapping between these two dimensions. So here's an overview of my talk. I'll first describe what I mean by confidence, explain how we studied in, in the lab, and highlight findings on the neural basis of confidence. I'll then present our work on private confidence, which Steve Fleming, is, which, which Reed alluded to, where we have used a novel task to isolate neural signatures of confidence in the human brain. I'll then move on to our more recent work on public confidence, where we study how the mapping from private to public confidence changes with the context and how the brain support, supports this mapping process. And then finally, I'll sketch out just in a couple of slides where I'm planning to take this work going forward. OK. So what do I mean by confidence? So in everyday language, confidence has many different meanings. But in decision neuroscience, we use confidence in a narrow sense. And in particular, we use it to refer to an estimate of the probability that an action or a belief, whether you've made it overtly or covertly, is correct given the evidence. And this is what I'm going to call probability correct or p-correct for short. And here you should think of decisions and, be and beliefs in a very broad sense. So it can range from individual experiences what you might call local experiences to general propositions that are evaluated over much longer timescales. Now, having a sense of confidence is, from a computational point of view, useful for adaptive control of behavior. So here are just some examples. So for example, when you have to make a series of decisions, and success requires that each decision is correct. So imagine you might be trying to assemble an IKEA furniture. You have to get all those steps correct in order to assemble the furniture. So you have to monitor the success. There's no point in, in implementing a later step if, if you think that the earlier steps were incorrect. Having a sense of confidence is also, or a feeling of confidence, is also important when deciding how much time to invest into learning. It also allows you to recognize mistakes and rectify these before it's too late, something that Steve Fleming has studied, my, my previous postdoc supervisor, has studied quite a lot. And also, having a sense of confidence also allows us to change our mind as new information comes to light. Okay. So how have we studied decision confidence? Now, the most commonly used laboratory system for studying confidence uh, is so, looks something like this in a, in a schematic form. And it's, it's using sensory psychophysics. And we use sensory psychophysics as we can use it both with humans and animals. And typically, on a trial, a subject would make two responses. So the first response, as you see here, is a, is a decision about some stimulus. For example, you might ask the subject to decide whether a cloud of dots is moving to the late, that moving to the left or to the right, whether a Gabor patch is tilted counterclockwise or clockwise, or whether an odor mixture can, smells more like compound A or compound B. And then there's a second response, and this response is about the choice that you just made. And typically, what happens in these tasks is that in order to maximize reward, you have to estimate the probability that that initial choice was correct. And in humans, uh, we can we can. We can ask them how confident do they feel, so we can ask them, for example, to estimate their confidence on, on a scale using, using a marker like here. And in animals, we, because they can't tell us what they're thinking, we instead use these implicit measures of confidence, if you like. For example, how long is a rat willing to wait for a reward before moving on to the next trial? Or whether a monkey will, will opt out of a trial for a small but certain reward rather than commit to a choice. 
And this general approach has been used with various species and techniques to identify neural areas that are involved in, or at least predict, confidence-based behaviors. So these are sort of the greatest hits. So you have rat orbitofrontal cortex, monkey LIP, monkey midbrain dopaminergic neurons. And in humans, we, we see a whole range of areas, such as the striatum, DACC, and different frontal areas. And I'm going to go um, over the course of the talk. I'm, I'm, hopefully, I'm going to um, use self our experimental framework to narrow down the, the, the computational role that these different neural areas play in, 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 in the formation of confidence. Now, an issue with this approach, which um, which might not be immediately apparent, but but should be apparent if you if you think about it, is that is that in a task like this, multiple computations can underline a sense of confidence, even in these simple decisions. So, in this particular task, um, in order to compute a sense of confidence. You need an estimate of the reliability of the sensory information. Then you need to combine that with some knowledge about the choice you made. Then you need to take into account some mapping from this estimate of probability correct to the response you required to give, and that depends on the rewards of the environment. And, and without dissociating these components, then when we go and say, oh, look, we have a confidence signal, it might not be a confidence signal. It, well, it might encode a component of confidence, but there's no one to clear one-to-one -one mapping, as it could be any of these sources of of information that goes into that computation. So to illustrate the problem, here we have the classic random dot motion task. Now, if I make the coherence of the dot motion stronger, you will have both greater certainty about the motion direction and greater confidence in your choice. So in this task, it might look like you have a confidence signal in the brain, but maybe that signal doesn't even care about what choice you made. It might just care about the reliability of the sensory information. I'm going to unpack this, this point a bit more. OK, so, so I hope to have persuaded you that, that while we have made significant advances in our understanding of confidence, we still don't have a good idea of its precise neural basis. And this is precisely the issue that we tried to tackle. And this is work I did with uh, when I was a postdoc in Steve Fleming's lab at UCL, which was up until, um, up until June this year. And of course, we still continue to collaborate on many of these questions. So, so we have a problem when confidence here, depicted by this blue-yellow color scale, cannot be disentangled from the stimulus. So as you see here, whenever the stimulus is stronger, confidence is higher. So what we did is to create a task where confidence must be constructed not from one, but from two stimulus dimensions, uh, a tale of two difficulties, as, as, as Reed put it, with a, with a reference to Charles Dickens. So here's the task. And I'm going to take you through the different steps of the task. So on each trial, you first view um, a field of moving dots, which you see here. A fraction of these, these dots are going to move coherently in a given direction, which we sample anew on each trial. And the remainder of the dots are just going to move around randomly. And what we did is that we varied the fraction of coherently moving dots, which you see down here, in order to create trials that are characterized by the low or high sensory certainty, sensory reliability, if you like. Now, after you've seen the dots, you still don't know which choice you're going to make. You're only going to know which choice you'd like to make after you've seen the reference. And your task is to say whether the direction of dot motion is clockwise or counterclockwise to this reference. So you say, do you think that the dots were moving towards the orange or the blue arc, if you like? And what we did here is to vary the distance between the, the true direction of dot motion and the reference in order to create trials that are characterized by low or high choice or boundary difficulty, if you like. So this is a different influence on your confidence than, than the sensory reliability, which comes in over here. And then finally, after you've made a choice, we ask subjects to estimate how confident do they feel about this choice. And, and the key point is that because of our design, this estimate should, should, should not only be a function of coherence or sensory reliability, but also a function of boundary difficulties. So you need to integrate, combine these two components. And this is just to sort of hammer home the, the point. So in classic perceptual decision-making tasks, which we have here, confidence is entangled, if you like, with other choice-related quantities, such as sensor reliability. But what our design does is to disentangle confidence. It doesn't fully decouple them from these components, but it disentangles the two components in terms of how much influence they have on your sense of confidence on any given trial. And this is what we see in behavior. 
so this is from, from our PNAS paper last year, and it's also what we have seen in an FMI data set that, that's been collected here, and it's also what we see in the, in the surgical patients. And, and, and what, what you hopefully can tell, see from these two plots is that we have introduced these multiple influences on performance and confidence. And let me help you uh, decipher these plots. So here you have red and blue. Red indicates high coherence, blue indicates low coherence. And the x-axis indicates the distance between the motion direction and the reference. So the higher the distance, the easier the choice is. Okay? So my, you might be fairly uncertain about which way they're going, but they're sort of going over here. But because the reference is all the way over here, you're going to be able to tell it's towards the blue arc. And as you can see, both accuracy and subjective confidence reports over, over here show not only a, a main effect of confidence, but it also shows an interaction between Sorry, doesn't only show a main effect of coherence and distance, but also shows an interaction. So, so the slope for high coherence, the degree to which accuracy or confidence increases with distance depends on the level of coherence. And, 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 and the slope is steepest for the high coherence case. Okay, so we're now going to use our task, um, which I've just talked you through, to, to identify candidate neural substrates for decision confidence. And then later on, we're going to turn it around, and then once we have identified our candidate neural substrate, we're going to use activity in that area to predict subjective experience. But first, we're using our experimental factors to narrow down which areas might be involved in computing confidence. And we do this in a whole brain search. So when we do this, um, we find a single area, the perigenital anterior cingulate cort cortex, or PGACC for short, which tr tracks, I think you can see that over here, it tracks not only the main effects of coherence and distance, but also the interaction. And these are the contrast estimates, and this is the encoding of these uh, different factors in, in up sample activity estimates. So you can see this sort of come online nicely over time. And interestingly, it turns out that areas which I've put forward as a, as, as a neural substrate for decision confidence, such as the stratum and pre-SMA, only track single components of confidence rather than the confidence per se. So over here, you can see the areas that, that were not affected by the distance manipulation, but were affected by the manipulation of coherence. And over here, you can see areas that were affected by the manipulation of, of, of distance, a boundary difficulty, but were unaffected by the manipulation of, of coherence. OK, so the next thing we're going to do is test whether PGACC activity predicts subjective experience. So to this end, we're going to use these confidence reports, where, which were elicited every five to 10 trials in the scan session. And indeed, what we see here is that PGACC predicts subjective experience. So the higher the PGACC activity along the x-axis here, the higher the reported confidence. And this is the encoding of confidence in, in PGACC activity estimates. Now, our task also allowed us to test whether PGACC tracked the expected value or just the value of a choice rather than probability correct per se. Because what we did uh, in a trial by trial manner is that we varied the, the reward that was associated with making a response in that particular trial. And what we see here is that PGACC is not sensitive to this reward manipulation, whereas you see an effect in the ventral striatum, as you might expect. So, in ventral striatum, if this choice or this response uh, can potentially elicit a high reward, you see more activity. Now, in our study, in um, the study I did with Steve, we examined com confidence in single trials. But in a nice piece of convergent evidence, as you have over here on the right, um, a study by Marco Wittmann and Matthew Rushworth in Oxford, that this showed that PJCC is also engaged when people have to infer their performance over many trials. And, and, and they could create situations in which this had to be the case because they delivered false feedback. So you couldn't really tell whether you did well or poorly on a particular trial, but you got an outcome on each trial. And PGACC tracked and sort of a, a window rolling back into time of the out outcomes you've, you had accumulated so far. So I think these findings together suggest that PGACC supports self-beliefs, subjective confidence, not only on local timescales, but also on much longer timescales. We had no feedback. Yeah, that's correct. Making choices, I was 60% confident, 70% confident, extra. Yeah. So overweight. Is that a minus how uh, predictably compensated they were? Yeah, so they, 
So they're compensated according to their choices and confidence reports. And we use what's called the strictly proper scoring rule, so, which is like a truth serum. So, so if, if you're certain that you're going to be correct, it's in your best interest to report as high confidence as possible. If you think you got it wrong, it's in your best interest to report as low confidence as possible. But you, the, ba the way to, to perform best on the task is to make as many correct choices as possible and to be as confident as possible in those choices. But it, it doesn't allow you to... I mean, of course, in people's head, it might escalate to think you should just be confident all the time. But, but the scoring rule, which we talked them through, is, is meant to encourage truth-telling, if you like. Just one more question. So if, um, I guess, had you provided feedback, then you would have two competing um, broad effects, which is I'm doing the task, and I'm looking at the relationship between these two sources of difficulty. Mm. And uh, I'm sampling across different kinds of learning that goes on. So some might learn them faster than somebody else, and that would, be, that would really would be hard to analyze that way, unless you had an independent notion of So a no. So Steve. Uh, what was the, why did you decide to do it open, not without feedback, yes. to avoid trial by trial dependencies in confidence? Because we know there are those dependencies, but it's an interesting question. And, and Steve has a separate line of work with another postdoc uh, where they looked at how self beliefs are constructed in cases where you have feedback, don't have feedback, uh, to look at that interaction between your subjective sense of confidence and the feedback signals you get from the environment. I think that paper was published last year in Nature Communications, or this year, uh, Stephen Marion Rowe. Okay, so this far I've talked about private confidence and its neural basis, and I'm now going to turn to our work on public confidence. So we have seen that confidence is an important control signal for individual behavior, but confidence, as, as I discussed at the beginning of the talk, also plays an important role in social interactions. It guides behavioral control of behavior, sorry, it, it, it guides adaptive control of behavior in social situations. And in these situations, confidence is typically used to manage social influence. So, so, so I think one common finding is that people who are confident tend to be perceived as credible and persuasive control for other, controlling for other influences. And in group decision making, which is uh, what I'm going to focus on now, confidence is used as a reliability signal and the idea is that, confident, that opinions that are expressed with higher confidence should be given more weight when making a group decision. And that's what we see. Opinions expressed with higher confidence tend to have a higher impact on, on the decision that a group eventually makes. Now, this kind of confidence weighting, where you weight opinions by the confidence with which they're expressed in order to make a group decision, requires that these group members solve an, an intricate mapping problem. They might not think about it this way, but, but that's what happens in the abstract. So ideally, in an ideal scenario, people who interact would have the same mapping from private to public confidence. So in this scenario, the person who expresses higher confidence is always more likely to be correct. But in the real world, people tend to have different mappings. So in this particular case, blue is biased towards high confidence. And as a consequence, in this particular trial, let's say, blue expresses higher confidence than red, even though blue is, in fact, less likely to be correct, and the group risks making a suboptimal choice. In this case, it would have been better off if they had responded B rather than A, if you like. And I'm now going to present a series of studies in which we investigated how people solved this mapping problem. So um, this is a prelude to another social task I'm, I'm going to use. So. So just uh, trying to remember the details of it, and I'll, of course, uh, reiterate it later. So we had pairs of subjects perform a joint perceptual decision task. So in each trial, subjects privately indicate over here whether they thought a first or a second viewing display contained an oddball. And here I've highlighted the oddball for you. So this one is a pop-out Gabor, so it's different from the other Gabors in its display. And what you have to say, oh, I think I saw it in the first or the second display. So, you, so you're given this scale, and you make a choice by moving uh, the marker to the left or to the right. To the left, you think it was in the first display. To the right, you think it was in the second display. And each step further away from this mid midpoint indicates that you are more confident about your choice. So let's say I'm blue, so I think it was in the first display, and I'm f pretty sure that that was the case. Then I see my partner's response. In this case, my partner thought it was the second display, but they weren't so sure about the choice. 
And what we did was to implement this um, decision rule such that the opinion or decision made with higher confidence is always selected as the group decision, which sort of takes us back, links back to this particular problem, but then forces, pe forces people to solve this mapping problem. So in this case, my choice was selected, and it did turn out to be correct. So the group feedback was, was positive, because my choice was correct, my choice was selected, whereas my partner's choice was wrong. So the rationale behind this decision rule, as I just said, is that subjects must solve this mapping problem. They must learn to communicate the internal sense of feeling of confidence in a mutually consistent manner in order to make as many good group decisions as possible. So, so if, the, if they solve this problem, what do we expect to see? Now, intuitively, if subjects can solve the mapping problem, then we would expect that the difference in, in subjective, in reported confidence to track the difference in performance, right? So if you have the same mapping, if you're much better than me, you should be more confident than me. We don't have this bias problem. But this is not what we found. In particular, we found that, that the relationship between the difference in, in people's performance and the difference in people's confidence was far from optimal. And here the opt optimal is indicated by this solid blue line. And we, we call this particular phenomenon for we dubbed the confidence matching. And the idea is that you, you seek to match your confidence regardless of these baseline differences in performance. And you can see here I've plotted the um, data from five different experiments where we had anonymous interactions, we had in, interactions that were incentivized, and also remember people get feedback, so they should know who's worse, who's better. And if you ask them, indeed they can classify who's worse, who's better. Still they, they, they carry on with this behavior. And I think this plot nicely illustrates the phenomenon so over here you have, um, you have the mean confidence for pairs of subjects, subject one and subject two, when they perform the task on their own. And then they perform the task together, and you can see the dots are drawn towards the diagonal, so they're sort of converging to some common midpoint. And what are the consequences of, of confidence matching? Well, intuitively, if, if you want to, so this is the optimal case over here on the left, and on the right we have the matching case. If you want to, achieve similar outputs with different inputs, you have to use different mapping functions. And this misalignment is going to cause miscommunication. And that's also what we saw in the data, that, that empirical performance fell short of optimal. So why, why confidence matching? Well, one explanation is that subjects might have sought to minimize cognitive costs, because confidence matching is computationally cheap. You only have to track what someone else is doing, not whether they're doing that for, for the right reasons. And it might also be a sensible heuristic to employ when, you, when it's hard to establish expertise on a given task. However, in our case, you should have been able to do so. Of course, another set of explanations um, touch upon the social aspects of the task. Because you might, you, might, you might argue that confidence matching reduces conflict and it diffuses responsibility for difficult decisions, if you like. Because everyone is roughly going to have an equal influence on the group decision. Okay, so the work I've presented this far has largely been, con been concerned with these sets of computations and the neural correlates. And we're now going to come full circle, if you like, and present, and I'm gonna present um, results from two sets of studies in which we directly manipulated the mapping required between private and public confidence, such that you had to change the mapping that you, that you needed from, on a trial by trial basis. Okay, and in particular, we wanted to test um, the neural hypothesis, if you like, that this private-public distinction is reflected in subdivisions of frontal cortex. And the idea is that these medial areas support the formation of an internal sense of confidence, whereas these more lateral areas support the transformation of this internal variable into a, um, into a context-dependent representation that you can communicate and share with others, a more malleable representation. And we've already seen that PGACC, for example, which is located in the medial wall of frontal cortex, satisfies the criteria for a neural substrate of private confidence or decision confidence. And we know from other work that more lateral regions um, in, in frontal cortex support explicit confidence reports and they also support different forms of behavioral control, such as task switching, which are functions which you presumably need in order to select context-appropriate public actions. So how did we test our hypothesis? Now, 
we had subjects perform a task that's not too different from the task I talked about before. So, so here you're making judgments about a random dot motion stimulus. So at a, here it's just are the dots going to the left or to the right? And we vary the coherence, the fraction of coherently moving dots. So we have, we have low coherence, high coherence. So here you're really uncertain about which way they're going. Over here you're really certain about which way they're going. So you see the stimulus, you make a choice, and then the context is revealed in that particular trial. And over the course of the task, you're going you, you're gonna to interact with four different partners. And this is going to be in a trial-wise manner. Some partners are very low in confidence. Other partners are very high in confidence. And you simply have to learn that behavioral profile through, through experience. So I make my choice. I see the context. Now I estimate my confidence in my choice. So I chose right. I'm not so sure about this choice. Then my partner's response is displayed. In this case, my partner chose left. And their choice is selected because they were more confident than me. Then I see the outcome. Well, it turns out that they were actually wrong, and we would have been better off if we had gone with my choice on this particular trial. Uh, <clears throat> for the social context, I presume what is meant there is each of those four subjects are demonstrating and exuding the level of confidence, confidence that you see. It, there's no history there, is there, where you, you have had experience with, with subject one or genitals or whatever, and you formed your own? Opinion. Yeah, so, so I guess, so, so it, and I think a very interesting question is, is where, where if, if, if you had different kinds of prior coming into play, if you had experience with them on something, on some unrelated task, how is that going to shape what you're going to do in this particular task? But here they're just presented with these four avatars which have names assigned to them. And then just by playing the task, you have to learn that in this case, Jennifer is more confident on average than some of the others. Okay, um, yeah? And what is the accuracy distribution of the social Yeah, so, so, we've, so the stimuli are picked such that subjects on average are about 70% performance, I think. And, 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 yeah, and, then, and then the partners are specified such that they have the same performance as subjects. So they're all just as good as you are. Now, I'm not going to show this. People... People still think that the low confidence ones are, are worse than they actually are. And then they tend to think that the high confidence ones are better than they actually are. But their performance is the same. Where's the, where's the accuracy of the partner display? Is this like an outcome delivery? Yeah. I mean, it's, so it's implicit here, right? Because their choice was selected. It was wrong. They made a different choice than you. So you must have been correct. Now, like, just looking at this particular slide, you might think that's bit tricky to, for subjects to understand in, yeah. in the moment. Or but the, statistics over but, the, but, but they do, I mean, they, don't, they do hundreds and hundreds of trials. And, and, and the, the particular training procedure is such that first you're paired with one person for X number of trials, you go to the next person, then we start interleaving them, and then you move on once you've sort of separated them. Well, we don't expect people to separate them, but after X number of trials, we stop there training procedure. And the idea is that, that in order to maximize reward in this task, you, you have to adapt your mapping according to the social context. So for instance, let's say you're paired with the low confidence partner and you always report higher confidence than them, then the reward distribution, the, the, the reward you can obtain for different behavioral policies, it's just going to drop as you become more and more extreme in your behavior. And over here, you have someone who always reports high confidence. And if you always report lower confidence than them, then you're not going to benefit from your own correct decisions, right? So over here, you're not benefiting from their correct decisions. And over here, you're not benefiting from your own correct decisions, if you like. Wait, so the two competing influences there. Uh, I could lie about my confidence, yeah. given some level of accuracy. Yeah. Um, no, because, I, I because you, so, the, so, so what's, what's going to happen? So, so what happens here, the model, if, if, so this is assuming you and I are equally good. Now, if, if you're better or worse than me, the, the hotspots are going to move around this landscape. Okay, equally accurate. Is that what yeah. Guess? Yeah. And then separately, equally willing to report yeah. as truthfully as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So those could vary independently, right? You, you match. 
Yeah, but, yeah, so I think that was the question before. Like, yeah, so they're matched on your performance. So they have the same performance as you. And your performance is also calibrated to a certain level. But it is true that, that um, in more complex scenarios, you can start just not caring or as, as a way to solve this problem, perhaps. Why do you break? Yeah. Because if, if you stop caring, then, then reporting lower confidence, then this person is the right thing to do. Right? So this is all conditional on two levels of performance. And, 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 and the peak is going to move around depending on how good we are relative to one another. So, so here we have the behavioral data, um, mean confidence. And, and the warmer the color, the higher the mean confidence. Um, and as we expected, subjects' mean confidence increases with motion coherence. So the colors become warmer along the x-axis. And, but critically, subjects' mean confidence also increases with the partner's confidence. So the colors become warmer along the y-axis. So, so the confidence that you report reflects properties of the stimulus and properties of the social context. So it's a halo effect of confidence. If you're around confident people. It, well, so, so I think a separate question is, is whether do people truly feel more confident? I, I don't know that. They definitely say they are more confident. But that's also required by the task. That's the solution to the task, if you like. But that's, I think that's an interesting question, yeah. Now, so we, so we trained subjects on the task prior to scanning, and then we removed the showdown or outcome phase in the FMI session in order to minimize trial by trial dependencies or learning effects. Now, in a separate study, we bring the learning back into the scanner. I'm going to show you some of the influences there. So today, so this is still work in progress. Today, I'm going to show you results from three ROIs. So we have the DACC, or posterior medial frontal cortex. We have PGACC, which sits in the medial wall. This was our confidence hotspot from the previous study, if you like. Then we have the lateral frontal pole, which we know is, is involved in generating these explicit reports and, and supporting different forms of behavioral control. So, so here we have the effects of our task factors on our eye activity when the current context is revealed to subjects. So this is activity when you see the current context, yeah? And then we have these different terms. So C is, is, the, um, is the coherence, P is the partner, then we have the partner squared and then some interaction terms. And what we see is that the PGACC, in line with what we saw before, only cares about the coherence, which is the driver of your internal confidence in this particular task. Whereas the, the lateral frontal pole, FPL, cares both about the coherence but also the context. In particular, with this analysis, what we see is this quadratic encoding profile. So what we see is, is that activity is highest for the low confidence and the high confidence partners. So those are the two partners where you have to deviate from what you might call your default behavioral policy. You have to do something that's unusual given how you're feeling, if you like. Now, these effects tell us that lateral frontal cortex is sensitive to social context, but our hypothesis makes a more specific prediction about the, the lateral frontal cortex. And in particular, what we would like to see is that this area carries a representation of the full task space, because you need this kind of representation in order to select which, which action is most appropriate for a given sensory state in a given social context. And to, and to address this question, we're going to turn to this multivariate technique called uh, representational similarity analysis. And this is just sort of a basic primer for our essay, um, as I assume not everyone is going to be familiar with it. So in broad terms, what our essay does is that it, con it considers the multivariate pattern of activity across voxels within a brain area rather than the mean activity across voxels. So imagine you had an experiment where you showed people three different kinds of sponges, yeah? And what you see is on average, activity is the same in, in the medial temporal lobe in this particular case. Now, the idea of RSA is that if you consider activity in a multidimensional space rather than averaging across the voxels, this high dimensional space, where does rep activity lie? Considering the activity in each of the, of the many voxels within inside your ROI. So the idea is that, that this geometry of, of the multivariate pattern is going to carry information about the representational content so here, let's just assume we have three voxels. And if you plot, if you plot the um, activity, the pattern of activity in these three voxels, what you're going to see is that, is that the distance between the point D1 
these two points is much smaller than the distance between these two points and A, which is SpongeBob. So this would suggest that SpongeBob is represented as being distinct from these other kinds of sponge. And the idea is that this is not something you would have seen if you just averaged across all these voxels. Yeah? So in a high dimensional space, these conditions are actually distinct, whereas if you collapse it down into one dimension, which is just a mean, you can no longer separate them. And what we did was sort of one step more complicated than what I just showed you. And what we asked is, is whether the multivariate pattern is more stable across scan runs within a particular condition than between scan runs. And the idea is that if, if, if you have higher within condition stability, then this indicates that a brain area represents a particular condition. So let me walk you through this particular case. So one condition in our design is, is the low coherence, low confidence partner. So that's one condition. We have a four by four design, so we have 16 conditions in total. Now we have four scan runs. So, so people perform the task, we stop the scanner, they perform the task, we stop the scanner, and so forth. And what we're going to ask now is whether the pattern of activity for this particular condition across scan runs, whether it's more similar within the condition than when comparing this particular condition to any other condition. Yeah? And this is a different way of showing it. So what we have here is, is um, um, so this is just a, a sketch, not, not actual data from an ROI. What we have here is, is that we're looking at how similar is the pattern of activity for this condition compared to this condition across scan runs and then to all the other conditions. Now, if you perform this kind of test for all our combinations, then we can get a matrix like this. And then we can compute an overall condition discriminability index as, as the average, as the average, uh, sorry, as the average between condition dissimilarity, minus the average within condition dissimilarity. And the idea is that that if these differences along the diagonal are smaller, then this suggests that this particular area has a stable representation of that condition. It's a stable neural pattern. And if we can, and if we can find this this to be true, we could say that this brain area represents the full task space if we find it considering this entire, this, this entire design matrix. We could, of course, also do a similar analysis for the reduced space of just coherence as you have here or just partner in order to assess how much information you have for each of these factors. And again, it's just asking whether the representation for the low coherence stimulus across, across scan runs is more stable than when you compare this to any of the other conditions, yeah. And here I should, should acknowledge Ham, Hamid Nili, who has played a central role in developing these methods and also is a collaborator on this project with me and Steve. Okay, so what we find when we compute this representational matrix for our three ROIs is that FPL is the only area which represents the full partner by coherent space, yeah. So we think that this is um, additional evidence that lateral frontal cortex plays a role in guiding the selection of context-appropriate actions. So this is a little, little aside um, to that particular point. So what we have here is um, what we've done this far is look at, um, at representations and activity averaged across trials within a condition. And what we're looking at here is the encoding of confidence on particular trials. Yeah. So we're looking at how, how does activity in a particular ROI vary when you report high versus low confidence. And we have three different colors. The pink one is sort of um, is something we've computed by, by regressing out the social influence. So, so you could say this is what you would have said if there was no social context. The blue one is what you actually said. And then the green, green line is, read knows a lot of these three three colors from yesterday. And the green line is the absolute difference between the, these two signals. So in pink, think of this as what you would have said. Blue is what you actually said. And green is the absolute difference between the two. And what you can see is that not so much in, in the in lateral frontal cortex, but more in these medial frontal regions, you see a strong encoding of what, what you felt, what, what you did say, and also the difference between the two. And you see this more strongly in the DACC over here. And this is just a, a connectivity analysis. So what we're looking at here is connectivity between the DACC, lateral frontal cortex, 
And we can see that the coupling between these two areas increases when the difference between what you would have set and what you actually set is high. So when more control is needed, if you like. So this sort of points to a picture where you have a region that has the task representations and another region that is involved in controlling trial by trial behavior or momentary behavior, if you like. So what about learning? So, so we have considered how private public mappings are represented and used in a steady state, but how do we learn these mappings from experience? How did subjects learn which, which actions were appropriate in a given context, if you like? So this is a question I've, I've studied together with Sarah Shatmanesh, uh, who's a PhD student who, who has been visiting UCL from, for the last year. And, and what Sarah did was to formalize this behavioral control problem using reinforcement learning. Um, so, that, so this is just a sketch of the, of the basic idea. So, so the idea is that we can formalize a private public mapping as a function which describes the value of taking a particular action when you're in a particular private state. So let's say, say here you are in, in confidence state three. So this is the value of, of, of reporting these different levels of confidence when you're in that state. Um, and let's assume we have, we have such a function for each of the four contexts. What we then do is that we select an action probabilistically. So, so, so the probability that we choose an action is proportional to the value of what we think is the value of taking that action when we feel this way and when we're in that particular social context. We then get an outcome. And here I map sort of medium private confidence onto medium public confidence. So this is my response. Now, so finally, after I've, I've seen what happened in this particular trial, I can go back and update my value function. Yeah? And what Sarah found is that there's sort of two kinds of prediction error in play. So first, there's the, there's the factual outcome, if you like. So people update what we have here. So people update the chosen action according to the experienced outcome, sort of a classic reward prediction error. So you said three when you went state three. And that was, that was bad, so I decreased my estimate of the value of taking that action when I'm in that state. But of course, you can also learn a lot more from, from the outcome. You can, you can learn about the other actions you could have taken and what would have happened if you had taken those actions. What she, she has shown is that people also update the unchosen actions according to the outcomes that could have been obtained. So what, we, what you might think of as fictive or counterfactual prediction errors. So this particular case, if you look here, or if you consider the scenario down here, the outcome could have been positive had I reported high confidence. So even though I didn't report high confidence, I want to, in the future, make sure when I'm in this state, when I feel this way, maybe I should be a bit more confident. And these are just some predictions from the model. And as you can see, it, it, it ni nicely recap reca recapitulates the behavioral data. So it reports higher confidence when coherence is high and when the partner confidence is high. And it's just learning this from scratch. Um, this is the evolution of, of, of mean confidence for the four different partners across time. Now, one difference between the model and behavior is that, is that this separation happens much earlier in, in our human subjects, suggesting that they bring a bit more structural knowledge to the task, right? They're not just learning tabula rasa from the outcomes. Now, so the, so, so the question, um, a follow-up question for this is that, is, is, is how does the brain sculpt these, these task representations across time? So we might think these task representation lives in frontal cortex, but, but for now, let's just ignore that aspect and just ask uh, what kind of update signals do we see in the brain at, 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 on, the, on the delivery of an outcome? So we're gonna focus on this part of the experiment. So this is a separate FMI study where we brought learning back into the scanner. So all the learning happens inside the scanner. So you're again paired with, with different partners. Now on each scan run, you just have two different partners because if you give people four partners, they just learn one common policy. They don't really distinguish between the four partners. So you need two, two partners. So then they get outcomes, and then we're gonna look at what, what do we see in the brain at, at, at outcome delivery. So that's sort of, on a given trial, there's sort of eight things that can happen. So we have, if you like, a, a two by two by two design. So at the top level, um, you and the partner could, could either have made the same, sorry, made the same decision or made different decisions. Yeah, if you made different decisions, we call gonna call that disagreement. We disagree about which way the dots were going. Now, 
if let's say we agree, so let's say we disagree, then what can then happen is that either I'm selected, either I'm selected or I'm not selected. Yeah, those are the two outcomes. Either I'm more confident than my partner or the other way around. So a response is selected. Once the response has been selected, this outcome could be positive or negative. Yeah? So, so these are different subjects, okay. yeah, okay. yeah. But again, it's, it's something I'm interested in in the future. Sort of how you bring prior experiences with sort of maybe similar people to to learning about people who are different, but maybe look like the other ones in some some interesting aspects. Now, um, so these are our eight different conditions, eight, the eight different things that could happen on a give, in a particular trial. And what's interesting about the cases over here is that when we agree, there's no alternative outcome. If we agree and it turns out that, that the outcome was neg positive, then it would have been positive either way. If we, if we agree the outcome was negative, it would have been negative either way. However, over here when we disagree, there's some interesting cases where there's a difference between the outcome we got and the outcome we could have gotten. Um, and I've just put some labels on this to help me remember what, what they mean. So imagine, so what happens here is that we disagree, you are selected, the outcome is negative, but it could have been positive, right? So it's your fault that we got it wrong, in a sense, because you're the one who reported higher confidence than me. Over here, it's sort of a different scenario where you might say, oh, your partner is great because you disagreed, you weren't selected, but your partner got it right, which is good, right? Over here, you were selected, you got it wrong, it could, have, it could have been a positive outcome. So you might think, I'm an idiot, right? And this is, uh, should have been disagree, selected. I'm, it should have been, I'm great. Yeah. <laughs> Not, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, those, so those are the, um, the different things that could happen. So, so I know it's a little bit complicated, but you have to think about these, these three different factors. So there's agreement, disagreement, there's selection, not selected, and then there's reward, positive and negative. Just the three yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just going to show you results from a couple of our eyes um, to give you a sense of the kind of patterns we see. So, so, so here we're just looking in, in the ventral striatum across these different conditions. We have disagree, agree. Then we have the cases where I wasn't selected, where I was selected, then negative and positive. And when we do a regression on this, what we see is that ventral striatum only cares about the outcome that was received. So it's higher, it's higher when the outcome was positive, regardless of where you are along this. So there's, there's of course, some, some other small signals happening here, but none of this turns out to be significant. So the green is always higher than the red. Now, if we go to, a, to another area like the TPJ, which is often implicated in the social cognition, we see a much richer picture. So let me just walk you through it. So what we see here is that, is that there's more activity when we disagree. And this might make sense because now I really have to think about what I should do in the future. We also see that there's more activity when a subject is not selected. And this sort of fits with what we see in behavior because people tend to change more when they weren't selected. So they also like being selected. Because think of yourself doing this task. Like, there's not someone else there. This is you performing the task. So you, maybe you'd like to be selected. It doesn't have that social dilemma situation. So more activity when there's disagreement. There's more activity when I'm not selected, which you see these two compared to these two, and then these two compared to these two. We also see there's more activity when the outcome is negative. So the green, so the red bars are higher, higher than the green bars. And, and in addition, we see an interaction that this activity is, this difference for positive and negative outcomes is, is higher when a subject isn't selected. So it really looks like the TPJ is doing a lot of, of the work in terms of figuring out what happened in this trial, what could have happened if I'd done something different. So what we're looking at right now is, um, is to take these uh, activity signals uh, and see whether responses to outcome delivery shape changes in these representations across time, right? So you might imagine it, look, if you have a lot of activity, there's a lot of prediction error on this particular trial, 
you might imagine that the representation in this trial and the next time I see the blue partner, uh, the difference in those representations is going to be higher because there's been a lot of learning. Okay, so I just have two more minutes, I think. So we've seen that private and public confidence can be dissociated and that this distinction is reflected in medial and, and lateral area, uh, frontal areas, or medial and lateral subdivisions, if you like. So finally, the, the broader picture. So, so I hope to have persuaded you that, that the concept of private-public mappings uh, provides a useful way for thinking about contextual modulation of social behavior. And I hope to have shown you that confidence is a useful way to, to think about these private-public mappings. So, 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 so two different directions. So, so one aim is to study tasks where there's uncertainty about the current context or the space of context. So, so these are situations which you often experience in everyday life. So for example, over here, you can imagine a task where you have to infer the identity of the partner or the context uh, from, from different visual cues, right? So, so you might think you're in this particular situation uh, you're not entirely sure. There's some things that indicate that this is uh, situations where you should do this, take this particular set of actions, but you're not sure. How does the brain resolve that ambiguity compared to situations about where you're very sure about what kind of situation you're in? There's also, you could imagine, I mean, so, so this is not exactly how I would, would implement it, so it's just a visual intuition. Um, but you can imagine a task where there are different behavioral types that vary in terms of their confidence, then you have to learn these types from different, from different attributes. So you have to learn some latent, latent clustering of types across different dimensions. So these kinds of learning problems are obviously going to require more sophisticated machinery than the, than the computational models I, I outlined earlier. And another aim is, is to understand um, how the brain supports these component processes, if you like, in, in a particular situation. So we already have an idea about the different neural areas that might be important for, for solving these computational problems. And, and the idea is to use um, faster techniques such as MEG or the new OPM MEG system to look at how these different problems are being solved in real time and how that solution is sort of compiled across time, if you like. And also inter interesting questions about the role that neuromodulators might play in shaping these prefrontal task representations. And, and the idea of, of, of teasing it out in this particular way is, 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 that, is that by, by adopting a computational approach to, to, to even these kinds of problems, you can see that there are different routes to social dysfunction. So for instance, you might have a set of people who, who, who struggle learning the space of context or identifying what context they're in right now. You might have people who, who have difficulties inhibiting prepotent actions. So they might know they shouldn't do this, but they can't inhibit it. And you can also have people who might learn the wrong things from social experience. So they might be more sensitive to positive or negative outcomes, which is going to distort the social behavior going forward. So it's just to give you a sense of how decomposing social behavior, and in particular contextual social behavior into these component processes, how that might offer you a, a different window on, on the kind of things that could go wrong. OK, so. Oh, so this is actually my last slide. So I'm just going to finish with thanking my collaborators, and in particular, Steve Fleming, my, my postdoc advisor, and Chris Summerfield, my PhD advisor, and then, of course, Reed and, for, and everyone else here for hosting me on this, on this great trip. OK, thank you.
construct you want about, about this, this thing that you're seeing. And then, and then you have confidence, you have confidence in your own memory mm. or not. Mm. Uh, and how much, do you get at that or is it all kind of in, in relatively real time? So, the, so this, so this, so, so I think there are two parts of the question. So there's a literature on sort of meta memory, sort of how you assess your memories, which predominantly has been done in humans. Uh, but also sort of, it's also been done in monkeys where you, you, you see 10 images, then you see a new one. Had you seen this one before? How confident are you in whether you saw it before? Sort of the human narrative. But I think there's an, another aspect to it, which is something we haven't touched upon here. So here, the trials are statistically independent. So you sh your confidence should only be based on what you see right here, right now. But we know that there are also history influences. So we know what you saw in the past and what you said in the past influence what you say right now. And I think that if you move it more into more naturalistic situations, your confidence is going to be based on past memory, memories of past experiences of what you did in that case or what someone else did in that case. And that particular contribution of episodic memories to confidence or self-beliefs or social behavior hasn't really been studied, I think. I think there's a growing realization that episodic memories play an important role in, in speeding up learning and guiding behavior, but it's totally underexplored. Yeah, so, so, so they used to, f yeah, so you still have a distribution across the ratings. So it's not that they just end up just saying three, 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 three. It's just that the mean of those distributions. So what we show is that, is that the mean and the variance of these distributions converge. And you can also just think about the actual distributions and look at divergence between the distributions, and that gets smaller. But that's not total, because if you did that, there would be a lot of information lost, right? Your confidence would no longer carry information about the stimulus. So you still want some of that. But it's, um, it's, it's an interesting question. To what degree, how far would you go in terms of uh, converging? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rich. Yeah.